The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, we review the newly reopened National Portrait Gallery in London, discuss a show of William Edmondson at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, and explore Zinzi Minot's film about the Windrush generation. The art newspaper's editor Alison Cole and London correspondent Martin Bailey join me to review the National Portrait Gallery after its £41 million revamp. I talked to Nancy Ierson at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia about the exhibition William Edmondson, A Monumental Vision. Edmondson was the first African-American artist to have a solo show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 1930s, but has rarely been shown in museums on the US East Coast since. And this episode's Work of the Week marks the 75th anniversary of the arrival in the UK of the Empire Wind. Windrush, a boat carrying passengers from the Caribbean. Cindy Minot, the choreographer and artist, has made a film called Fidem about the Windrush on this anniversary every year since 2017. She tells me about the latest iteration, which is at the heart of a new exhibition at Queer Circle in London. A reminder that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from a digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, the latest series of which finished this week with a conversation with Jeremy Della. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, the National Portrait Gallery in London reopened this week after closing for more than three years as its building has been transformed and its collection rethought and rehung. The art newspaper's editor, Alison Cole, our London correspondent, Martin Bailey, and I all went to the gallery this week and we gathered to discuss our impressions. Martin, before we talk about our impressions of the new National Portrait Gallery, can you tell us the facts about what this transformation has cost and so on. Yes, in terms of cost, the total is £41 million. And of that sum, £29 million was for the building work and the other money was for uh, the rehanging, conservation, touring some of the paintings uh, to other galleries in the UK and other associated costs. So it is quite an expensive project. And the gallery has been closed for just over three years uh, the NPG was fortunate in a sense that it happened during COVID to begin with. Yeah. So it's been closed for quite a long time. Right, it has. Alison, the first impression is almost like the most important impression, it seems to me, of the new building, because one of the things that we all of us would have experienced was this terrible pokey entrance that the National Portrait Gallery used to have. It was hugely inadequate. What did you make of the new entrance? Well, it makes a big difference the old entrance was on the Charing Cross Road. The new entrance faces Leicester Square. It's much more generous. There is a little courtyard and a flight of steps leading up to these new bronze doors by Tracy Emin, which have had a lot of reaction so far. It gives a sense of, you know, the National Gallery entrance in miniature because you've got this little public space and you've got a real sense of a threshold. There's a sort of dramaturgy I thought about it, in the sense that I always think a big museum needs a bit of scene setting, a bit of a narrative from the first moment you walk in through the doors. You never really got that with that rather pokey entrance in the past, did you, Martin? Yes, I mean, I found it exhilarating to walk in and it made me realise quite how important the NPG was and it was a wonderful feeling to see the collection after it had been closed for three years and I realised what we'd missed. But yes, physically the entrance is much larger and spacious and it, it gives a sort of feeling of anticipation before you get to the meet. Absolutely, and also it sets the scene in terms of the sort of democratic elements that we've been told about. You know, one of the things that Nicholas Cullinan, who, of course, you did a tour with, Alison, of the new gallery, is so keen to stress is this is a gallery for everyone. It's not just the great and good. All of us will see ourselves as well as the great and good in, in the new gallery. Yes, very much so. The new entrance obviously faces towards Soho as well, which was one of the problems, I think, <laughs> in the past. But it's now, you know, a very different kettle of fish. Tracy Emin's doors are about every woman. So although you've got this sort of pantheon of the male greats with 18 busts around the building, 
and a statue of Henry Irvin, the actor, which I think has been reorientated to face theatre land. That's right, yeah. So you've got this sort of redressing of the gender balance with the Tracy doors, and then you've got these wonderful palazzo floors when you go inside, and a sense of light because a lot of the windows have been unblocked. That's right. The sense of light is, again, one of the more palpable things about the new museum, isn't it, Martin? I mean, there are some galleries which now house the contemporary collection, which is called the Western Wing, which unbelievably were offices before. Uh, I mean, I think when one goes in, you've got two options. One is to take the escalator, which is easy and you get a good ride up, and then start at the top with the early Tudor portraits and work downwards chronologically. Or if you're otherwise inclined, you start on the ground floor looking at the contemporary and the very contemporary. Um, And then if you wish, um, go up the stairs and find the earlier works. Yeah, I think what's interesting is the escalator has been screened off from view because that used to be the feature. When you came in, you went straight up to the restaurant. And I think now, because it's more discreet, you get a sense of a ground floor. You've got a lovely, welcoming visitor desk, which is sort of double height. And um, you also have some of the permanent collection prominently displayed, whereas before it was very much about paying exhibitions. I think Nicholas Cullinan described it as a sort of paywall originally when you went in. That's an interesting phrase. I want to talk a bit about the collection and what those 20th and 21st century galleries and this new acquisitions gallery as well are doing. It seems to me that it's on that ground floor with the contemporary and modern collections that you really see how different the National Portrait Gallery is from other spaces in the sense that, Alison, there are works that are quite evidently about the sitter as opposed to the artist. As in, there is a frankly appalling, in my view, portrait of Ed Sheeran amongst them. There's a terrible portrait of the Prince and Princess of Wales, in my view, amongst them. But people are going to go to the National Portrait Gallery to see these people, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a it's a jumble. It's a jumble of sort of you know good portraits, bad portraits, celebrities, people we think are worth a portrait, people we don't think are worth a portrait. I think the trustees decide on the basis of curatorial recommendation who gets a portrait. So yeah, I think it's a pick and mix. Martin, do you get a sense of that sort of specialness of the National Portrait Gallery, if you like, through that very fact that the sitter comes first almost? Exactly. I mean, it's quite different to the neighbour next door, the National Gallery, where the art and the artist are absolutely key. And we must never forget that the Portrait Gallery is more about the sitters. And particularly if you go around the modern and contemporary section, you'll see celebs that are important now. Whether they'll be important in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, I don't know. But people going to the gallery want to see people that they know. It's rather dull seeing portraits of people you've never heard of. So we want to see pop stars or Henry VIII or someone we know. And the sitter comes first before the artist. Obviously, the gallery tries to represent people by good artists, but the sitter comes first. Yeah. Let's talk a bit more about the architecture. There is a space which is now called the Hans and Julia Rousing Room, which I found the most astonishing. It's the little space at the front of the gallery, which is just above the old main entrance. And it used to be this rather small and rather dull little space. They'd often have interesting exhibitions there. But there, too, they've unveiled windows. And suddenly that space sings. And in it, they've got a big display of women's self-portraiture. And that's another hallmark of the gallery, isn't it, now today, that Nicholas Cullinan's National Portrait Gallery is absolutely attempting to achieve a parity in terms of sitters and artists. Um, That's quite right. And that's a a, a very nice display. And, well, I love self-portraits because you learn more (laughs) about the artist in both senses, if you like. So that that display works very well. Physically, it's the same space, but it now seems sort of larger and more open. And hopefully that will give the opportunity for other similar displays in coming years. They've stuck with a chronological display, Alison. Do you feel that that's an essential part of the National Portrait Gallery, if you like? Yeah, I think it's very comforting. And I think, you know, starting with the Tudors, you immediately feel at home and you've got your great artist, you've got Holbein, and, you know, you're into the great history of portraiture as well as, you know, the great subjects. And I think it's it's a way of orientating yourself. They have obviously sort of 
quirky bits of the display where it doesn't strictly follow the chronological order, but you've got, you know, like the death masks or the miniature room. But, yeah, it's got a nice sense of orientation and sort of little interventions here and there. I loved the miniature room, Martin. It was just that there's a sense yeah. in which they're really sort of looking at, like, their crown jewels, if you like, and they're really highlighting. The miniature room is... Obviously, miniatures are difficult to display, but they seem to have done that really well, I think. Yes, and it's a fairly limited number. If you're going and see a display case with sort of 50 miniatures, you feel uh, defeated. So I think it's, it's well done. I should also add, I rather like the death masks because one didn't really expect them and one may have seen one or two odd ones in the gallery, but it, I thought it was rather interesting and moving to bring them together Absolutely. in quite a sort of dramatic display. And they do it by bringing it together with the contemporary, don't they? And mm. In a way, there's part of me that feels that they could have done that a bit more, actually. Yes, stick with the chronology, but have more contemporary and historical dialogue, Alison. Yeah, I think it works well having sort of live people in the death mask <laughs> section. <laughs> it's sort of, yeah, it seems a little bit paradoxical. But, you know, having Tracy Emin, Mark Quinn, whatever you think of Mark Quinn's bloodhead, is very interesting when you're looking at death masks of the like of William Blake. Uh, let's talk more about the historic displays. There is a absolutely remarkable room, I think, which is called Portrait, Portrait, Portrait. Uh, you can imagine the exclamation marks. And at the kind of centre of that room, Martin, is my. <laughs> the great Joshua Reynolds portrait, which you've been reporting about <laughs> for decades as national galleries in Britain have been trying to acquire it. There it is on the wall of the gallery. What did you feel when well, you saw it? Well, it is wonderful and uh, you see it from uh, several rooms before and then it's centrepiece when you come to uh, the gallery. At the opening last night, I talked to Nicholas Sirota, who was the director of the Tate, who tried to acquire it on many occasions, and he said, what a moving occasion. He said he almost sort of burst out into tears when he actually saw it on the wall. It may not be the ideal arrangement that it's jointly owned by the Getty, but it was the only possible way that it could have been acquired, and it will be in the UK for half of the time and then in California for the rest of the time. And it is a magnificent portrait. I mean, you know, we've all seen reproductions in the newspapers, but it's a huge painting and it has real wall power and it's got such an interesting story, if you like, historical story about relations with Polynesia and it has a lot of resonances today, although it was painted so many centuries ago. Absolutely. That, that display is quite something, isn't it, Alison? Yeah, I love that room. It's so grand and it feels like the climax of the whole visit because you've got this portrait which, as Martin said, has incredible wall power and it looks so fresh. The impasto looks like it's just been painted. And then you've got other portraits by Reynolds and Gainsborough around it. So you've got this sense, really, of, you know, the whole of Georgian England and then you've got, yeah, this amazing new acquisition which I think everybody was stunned by. The wall power aspect is something that I saw throughout the displays actually Martin, the way that they've used the major portraits between doorways the sight lines all the way through the displays are really dramatic so you always have these sort of long journeys towards these great portraits that worked really well I thought. I quite agree I mean the the, the way the display is done with the, the really key portraits sort of pulling you in works very well and it also sort of subtly signals to visitors which are the really important works because if you've seen it from a distance you realize the curators have probably considered that was quite an important work. The Tudors, Stuarts, Plantagenets etc that, that early part of the collection is always going to be a hit in a way for me always the most problematic element of the collection was that sort of 19th century into the 20th century bit in the sense that it was a lot of statesmen it was a lot of rather stiff portraits of royal families and so on. Martin, it had felt like a bit of a slog going through those galleries in the past. How did you feel they dealt with it now? Well, it's true. There were a lot of statesmen, all male figures. Uh, but I think in addition, there were quite a lot of interesting Victorian figures in the arts and music and other things, other sort of cultural fields. So I found it quite interesting. And I think one's got to cover all of the chronological periods. So if you've seen too many statesmen, uh, look round the corner and uh, find some musicians. They've added photography 
in those galleries, a lot more photography than used to be there. They've broken it up a bit, I think, to give it a bit more of a sort of texture, a bit of a bit more pacing in some way. Yes, I mean, photography is obviously, um, there's much more interest in it than there was 20 years ago or whenever the previous redisplay was done. So quite rightly, there's much more photography in the galleries. I mean, the photographs may have to be rotated for conservation reasons, but it's very nice that photography is being shown and I'm sure visitors will enjoy that. Alison, in those galleries, they're some of the ones where the the windows have been revealed. Um, Amazingly, they've been behind boards for for many, many years. They look really handsome, don't they? They do, and I think that was one of Nick's ambitions. His laundry list, as he said, was, you know, to open it up, open the windows, get the light in, sort out the wayfinding, and sort of generally make it more welcoming and harmonious. I was actually lucky enough to be in the galleries when the lights went out because they were testing the lighting in this sort of bit before it opened. But it was actually very instructive because over those windows, they've got this sort of very useful scrim. We should say Jamie Fobet architects who have done the renovation have done it incredibly sensitively. So there's this scrim over those windows, which means that where you have sensitive works, the light, it doesn't flood the rooms and and therefore damage the works. But one of the things that was interested was it's a very muted light. And again, I think that's a really important thing that the gallery needs to be flexible. It's not architecture which invades the spaces. It's not architecture which drowns out the works, is it, Martin? No, uh, I mean, um, I actually wasn't particularly aware of the lighting, but in a way, I think that's a compliment because one shouldn't be and uh, it's should be done properly so the visitor isn't particularly concerned about it and I agree the architecture in general is not something one notices particularly and I think that's a good thing sometimes architects have too much power over buildings and galleries and want to do something complicated and fancy Um, but it's just been done neatly so one goes through without being too aware. I think the one thing you are really aware of though is a colour palette It's very bold, so you get this wonderful, you know, going from blue to aubergine and then strawberry sorbet, which may be an acquired taste, but I liked it. That was quite good because it was in the Victorian rooms, wasn't it? Which can be a bit dull, frankly, and and it really lifted the work. I think that was the point, that if you get a little bit tired going through this procession of sort of varnished portraits, you're suddenly, you suddenly wake up. Yes, I'm not sure that the visitors would notice the colours. Again, we're going around sort of looking at the architecture, but I suspect most visitors, it's sort of unconscious. But the colours are important, and in a way it's, it, it may tell you which room to go into next, um, if it's the same colour, for example. So it's a, a subtle signposting. The interpretation of works of art in galleries has become a hot topic in recent months, Martin. And Did you get much of a chance to look at how the interpretation works in terms of the new hang? Well, I looked at some of the labels. To, to look at all of them, one would have to spend several <laughs> days, I think. Uh, I think they've been well done. Obviously, particularly in the last year or two, galleries have highlighted particular areas like slavery. And it is done in the NPG when appropriate but not in the crude way that some galleries have done it. And um, if I can name names, I I mean, Tate in particular um, has put very explicit uh, captions on some of the works. And I think the NPG has had a more measured approach, which works better for a wide range of people. That's interesting. I I kind of felt it could have been a bit more provocative. One thing is that there's a sort of singular voice to a certain degree. And I'd like to have heard more plural voices, more voices from communities who perhaps are living with legacies of slavery and so on. Alison? I think one of the ways they have done it is through new acquisitions, like the portrait of Doreen Lawrence, for instance. But also they've done it through judicious loans as well. So you do get a sense of a more diverse history but you don't necessarily have to read a big piece of interpretation. That's right. For instance, in the section where they're looking at the American Revolution, there is actually a Native American figure that's on loan. So there's a sense in which they're sort of plugging gaps to a certain degree. Yes. I just wanted to briefly touch on some of the non-art areas, if you like. There's quite a lot of different and 
refurbished and, and new spaces that are part of the building, Martin. A cafe on the ground floor and then a rather snazzy bar below, which is open until midnight and when the gallery isn't open and so on. But there's also this kiosk, which they bought not that long ago. Tell us about that. Yes, I think it'll be a surprise to people, but there was a public lavatory built during the Victorian period just outside the new entrance to the NPG. And it was later turned into a ticket booth that sold theatre tickets with a rather delightful small kiosk. Anyway, the NPG has bought this kiosk and it's got long-term plans to transform it into something really useful. But in the meantime, it's going to be used to sell coffee. And this summer, it is going to open um, and serve coffee in effectively in the street. And I think that would be rather a fun thing. Absolutely. So it's not open now, just to be clear, but it will open in the future. Overall then, Martin, I've said that Nick Cullinan wants this to be a very welcoming and accessible gallery. Do you think he's achieved it? I think he has, yes. And no doubt there'll be a lot of publicity about the opening and I'm sure they'll get good visitor figures. I think they're hoping for two million. They may get more in the next 12 months. But I think it will be successful. Rehangs never last forever, though. And no doubt in a decade's time, it will be done quite differently. But for now, he's done a great job. Alison? I think everybody was impressed. It manages to be both grand, it's based on a Renaissance palazzo, but also really accessible. And it's traditional but contemporary. And the labels weren't in your face. And there were marvellous things to see and... The navigation was easy. So I think all in all a great success. Alison and Martin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The National Portrait Gallery is open now. The exhibition Yvonne, Life and Colour is at the gallery until the 15th of October. Coming up, William Edmondson in Philadelphia and Zinzi Minot's Windrush film in London. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. A display at the Curve Gallery in London's Barbican Centre will be taken down in the wake of a censorship row. Barbican staff asked a speaker to avoid the topic of Free Palestine at a recent talk. The display by the London-based interdisciplinary design studio Resolve Collective was due to run until the 16th of July. In an Instagram post on the 21st of June, the group said it cancelled the display because of an act of anti-Palestinian censorship. Resolve Collective also mentioned a number of hostile encounters and shameful incidents during their exhibition. Claire Spencer, the chief executive of the Barbican, and Will Gompertz, its artistic director, apologised for the unacceptable experiences and pain caused to the members of the Resolve Collective and those involved in their exhibition. The British Museum has removed translations from its new exhibition, China's Hidden Century, after a translator alleged that their work had been used without permission, credit or payment. In a series of tweets on 18th of June, the Vancouver-based writer, poet and translator Yilin Wang shared images of the current exhibition and its accompanying catalogue, alongside their previous translations of the Chinese poet Kui Jin's poems dating back to 2021. Wang alleged that the exhibition includes their translated English text and that the museum had not contacted them for permission to use the translations, credited them in the exhibition or compensated them. The British Museum said that the lack of permissions and acknowledgement for the translations were an unintentional human error and that it has apologised to Wang. The Austrian government aims to propose legislation governing the restitution of objects in national museums acquired in a colonial context by March 2024, according to its culture secretary, Andrea Meyer. A government-appointed advisory committee called for a permanent intellectually and culturally diverse evaluation board to submit recommendations on returns of objects acquired in the colonial era. The government would then decide on the basis of its findings. The committee recommended that returns should be dealt with on a state-to-state basis. As many as 200,000 thousand objects in Vienna's Welt Museum were taken in a colonial context. The advisory commission defined objects eligible for return as those lost under conditions of violence, looting, theft, coercion or by deceptive means. You can read all these stories at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. We'll be back after this. <laughs> 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Christie's is thrilled to present the collection of Donna Summer, an online auction open for bidding until the 29th of June. In celebration of the legendary Queen of Disco, the collection highlights essential memorabilia such as RIAA gold records, handwritten lyrics, iconic ensemble, candid Polaroids and original works of art by the superstar. Experience these vibrant works in person at the Rockefeller Centre Galleries from the 23rd to the 27th of June. Find out more at Christie's. Welcome back. Now, this week, the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia opens the exhibition William Edmondson, A Monumental Vision. It's the first major exhibition on the US East Coast in decades to be dedicated to the work of the self-taught American sculptor, despite the fact that Edmondson was the subject of a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 1930s. The exhibition is co-curated by the Barnes's James Claiborne, Curator of Public Programmes, and Nancy Ierson, Deputy Director for Collections and Exhibitions. And I spoke to Ierson about the show. Nancy, would you begin with a brief biographical sketch of William Edmondson? Edmondson was born in Tennessee around 1874. The exact date of his birth is unclear. He worked a number of different professions before becoming an artist. Uh, He was working with horses, he worked on the railroads, he was a janitor in a woman's hospital. It was in the early 1930s that he had a vision from God and was called to carve And at that stage, he made a viable career carving tombstones for Nashville's black community. Right. So it's curious that, isn't it? Because obviously those tombstones, I guess, remain in place, but you do feature examples of those in the show. Works by Edmondson were sometimes created in advance of them being needed. So some tombstones have entered collections because... They were sold by the family after Edmondson died. Other works are still in situ. Some have entered collections because they've been placed there deliberately. So thankfully, yes, uh, (laughs) there are tombstones in the show, but not ones that have troubling provenances. That's good. Tell me about the language that he used, because it's very, very distinctive, completely unique, it seems, in some ways. Edmondson's visual language is varied. He was carving directly and really you sense that even though the chronology of his work is quite loose, um, you know, he wasn't dating his pieces, you do get a feel for him becoming more confident as a carver. So the pieces that he made initially in the 1930s tended to be more block-like. He was using stone that was cut for construction And sometimes the figures of nurses or teachers or angels really follow that form. Later on, and actually he's working for the Works Progress Administration for a time, they become more confident. You start to see him carving out the spaces between legs. Uh, We have a little crucifix in the exhibition where there's a real sense of a suspended body or there's a seated figure from the collection of the Newark Museum where a woman has her legs kind of almost kind of curved beneath her, a real kind of modernist twist to the body. So uh, one of the things we wanted to really do in the exhibition is point to the fact that Edmondson wasn't just working in one vein. You know, he's trying his hand at different genres, and, and even with his treatment of a single theme, there is a lot of variation. And in that variation, you have the kind of obvious subject matter. If he's got this calling from God, he's going to depict religious subject matter. But then also curious things, which it sounds like they're slightly unexplained, like the mermaids, for instance. So there's quite a range of iconography, right? There are some things that we can see within Edmondson's body of work and and get a really literal sense of how they might relate to a lived experience. And then others are absolute stretches of the imagination. And the piece that you mentioned, uh, a carving of a mermaid, is just one of those. Edmondson makes two images of mermaids within his career, and we're thrilled to have one. They are both in private collections. But there hasn't been one convincing reading of what that piece might mean. Now, interestingly, there is some scholarship that suggests there may be Yoruba resonances to that imagery. And one of the big questions there, I think, is, you know, how does Edmondson's work tell a diaspora story, you know, um, how does it relate to African imagery? There are no direct through lines, but of course, you know, the twists and turn of history have made that kind of work quite difficult. How do we, approaching his work now, not try to sort of shut down biography, you know, denying these possibilities, 
without falling into reductive stereotypes or or sort of tired narratives around how Edmondson's parents had been enslaved. You know, we're trying simultaneously to start with Edmondson and the body of work, but also acknowledge the the injustices that have you know come through in the telling of his story in subsequent years. Can you tell us more about those injustices? Because on the one hand, there is this extraordinary fact that he had a show in the 1930s at the Museum of Modern Art, but there are complications even in the fact that that show happened and the framing of it both by the institution and then by critics and so on. So could you say more about that? It's interesting how images of Edmondson have probably circulated more than Edmondson's works themselves. Uh, in the 1930s, Louise Dahl-Wolf, who was best known as a fashion photographer, was making work for Harper's Bazaar, tried to have those images of Edmondson that she made in Nashville published within the pages of the magazine, which she was prevented from doing. Just the racism of the, the magazine ownership at the time just wouldn't let that happen. She brought those images to the attention of the staff of the Museum of Modern Art, and this show comes about. Now, simultaneously looking at that, series of events now, we can see that Dahlwolf and the staff of MoMA were, for the time, trying to be progressive. They were white artists, curators, trying to show a broader story. And yet they were doing it at a time which was inherently prejudiced. And some of that does come out in the telling of Edmondson's story. While those images that Dahlwolf took are really seductive. They are clearly staged. They are artworks in their own right. And they give us a sense of what Edmondson looked like and what the yard looked like. And they're very valuable in that sense. They aren't documentary evidence. And there has been a wave of scholarship and Kelly Morgan in our catalogue really picks up on this as to say that, yeah, these images and MoMA's presentation in some ways played into negative stereotypes around black Southern creativity. Yeah, MoMA had Edmondson's work on show at a time when in Harlem, you know, not far from the Rockefeller Center where MoMA then was, black creativity was taking many different forms and directions. And the idea that MoMA chooses to show a self-taught artist from a rural part of America really was tough for black Americans in New York at that time. That's really interesting. So in other words, there was that so-called primitive lens that had already fallen on African art and then was being reapplied to an artist from the American South? Well, interestingly, MoMA also show Edmondson with folk artists, so also white folk artists. So again, there's not just this this racial dimension to the ways in which his work is being seen in the 30s, there's also a class dimension. Edmondson's work is also shown when MoMA sends an exhibition of folk art to Paris, in the 1930s. So it's a very particular uh, way of looking at American art from the South, and one that doesn't allow for the complexities of what we actually see in Edmondson's works themselves. You know, for instance, Edmondson is carving Eleanor Roosevelt. He's carving a boxer that we think might be Jack Johnson. So he's on some level aware of yeah, the push for civil rights, the push for equality. Some of his work has Egyptian resonances and, and it makes you think of, you know, Haile Selassie and Marcus Garvey and the, the sense of Egypt offering a, a sort of vision of black sovereignty. But none of this appears in these sort of limited readings of you know, a black artist working in a rural community, yet you know, very tied to the church. As curators now, we're trying to not kind of deny any of of these possible readings, but sort of see how they they sit together and how we can get a more complex and and interesting vision of the artist through that. You've included Louise Dahlwolf's photographs in the show, haven't you, and Edward Weston's Mm -hmm. as well. So in other words, you're saying to the audience, to a certain extent, it's up to you to decide what you think of these. We don't know about exact motivations. We don't know whether William Edmondson actually had any role in their transmission and so on. But equally, you're not shutting it all down and telling the audience what to think, as it were. Well, and I think that that approach that we've taken in showing those photos is one that feels right for the moment because, you know, stories are more complex. What does it mean for a white collector or a white photographer or a white curator to work with a black artist, to show a black artist if an institution 
has been thought of historically as a white institution, how does it make space for black creativity? Because, yeah, some of these questions are really timely. And rather than say how it should be or how it was, it's leaving that kind of question open. Could we get to a place where we imagine Edmondson's agency within that process? You know, those photographs are still you know, very clearly staged. Is this two artists working together? Does it necessarily have to be about a patron and a rural practitioner? You know, I think all of these stories could coexist and, and it's an encouragement really to look at the specificity of each relationship. And again, yeah, these sort of dynamics between artists. Tell me about the Barnes Foundation and its role in all this, because I've just seen in the last few months Isaac Julian's film called Once Again, Statues Never Die. And that has a really, really interesting engagement with Alfred Barnes, the history of the institution, Alan Locke, the great scholar. And of course, it's, it shows a sort of problematic relationship with art by black people, frankly. So to what extent is this sort of continued engagement with that, almost a sort of related project to the work that you did with Isaac Julian? The Edmondson show and our project with Isaac Julian, but also like our, our exhibition of Suzanne Valadon and our forthcoming exhibition about marie Laurence. At his best, Barnes had an incredible vision. You know, he was employing black Americans at a time when opportunities were fiercely limited. He was an advocate of education for all. He was also interested in promoting women within his factories. Uh, again, you know, he had a, a sort of sense of what it meant to be marginalised because he had grown up in impoverished circumstances. He'd really kind of worked his way from nothing. And I think he did have a, a profound sense of, of how life can be unjust. However, he was still a man of his time. You know, he was living in deeply racist times and a progressive at that time would have had their limitations. So within our programme, we try to honour the best of what Barnes did. We like to show a broad range of artists and to be very deliberate about that. But we also want to explore our institutional history. We know that Barnes potentially could have seen Edmondson's work. Mm. Yeah, he was friends with Locke. Locke was interested in Edmondson's work. New York isn't very far from Philadelphia. But there's no mention of Edmondson on our archive. So for whatever reason, Barnes chose not to buy Edmondson's work. He did, however, buy self-taught artists like Henri Rousseau. Right. So it feels like a very natural fit for us to have a show by Edmondson at the Barnes, but it's also helping us to critique our institutional history while we explore the work of an incredible artist. I wanted to lastly focus on the legacy of Edmondson, if you like, because I know that the most obvious example is that there are loads of works from Causes collection mm -hmm. in the exhibition. But do you feel he has a legacy in other artists' work? Can you see Edmondson as a direct influence on work being made today? I'm cautious of creating a kind of direct through line to the ways in which Edmondson was working an artist now because I really feel that that can, can sort of end up reducing, you know, <laughs> either or. I think what's perhaps more interesting is to think about how the kinds of creativity that have been sort of written out of formal art histories. Uh, I think it's really interesting that Edmondson hasn't received more attention, really, given how unusual his exhibition was in New York, the fact that he was uh, being collected by people like Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, you know, he could have been part of the sort of conventional 20th century art histories, and yet he wasn't. So, you know, perhaps he, he doesn't come up in as many places as you might think. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens moving forward. <laughs> it will be. Thank you very much, Nancy. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. William Edmondson, A Monumental Vision, is at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia from the 25th of June to the 10th of September. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. On the 22nd of June 1948, the Empire Windrush docked in Tilbury in Essex in southern England. The boat carried 492 passengers to the UK from Caribbean countries. They, along with others who arrived from the Caribbean between 1948 and 1971, became known as the Windrush Generation. Along with other people across what was then the British Empire, the legacy of which is the so-called Commonwealth, they were encouraged to move to the UK to help with post-war labour shortages. Many became nurses in the NHS, the British National Health Service, 
or drivers, cleaners or manual workers. In 2017, it emerged that hundreds of Commonwealth citizens, many from the Windrush generation, had been wrongly detained, deported and denied legal rights as part of the UK government's so-called hostile environment. Every year since 2017, the artist and choreographer Zinzi Minot has made a film called Fidem, and the latest iteration is part of Many Mickle Mecca Muckle, an exhibition at the Queer Circle Gallery in London. It opened on the 75th anniversary of the Windrush's arrival this week, and I spoke to Minot about the work. Zinzi, I wanted to begin by asking you about the personal background to this series of works, because is it right that your grandmother was an NHS nurse? Correct, yeah. Tell me more about that. So my grandmother, she worked as an NHS nurse, but my granddad also came over in the Windrush, and so did my dad, because my dad is quite a bit older than my mum. So specifically in relation to my gran, she worked as a nurse, as many Caribbean women and West African women of that time have done and continue to do so. Um, I also have a cousin who's a nurse and several aunties as well. So it's not just like this uh, one person. It's, it's, I guess at this point, it's a cultural profession. You know, lots of Caribbean women go into the NHS. And I think specifically with my gran, it was almost like she was in the army. Like the way she spoke about it and the way she spoke about her uniform and her pride and her sacrifice it seemed like service, like really, like uh, she spoke about it like service. The only other way I've heard that is from people who served in the armed forces. She really spoke about when I put on my uniform and what that meant to her to serve in the NHS and to take care of people. And that care was not dependent on what she received, you know, because she definitely spoke to me about the abuse that she got and yet you care, you know, it was very much a decision for her to do that. And she spoke to me about her retirement, how that felt, and maybe her disappointment when she retired. I remember, because my grand passed away many years ago now. You know, we knew she was going to die. She was unwell, so it wasn't a surprise. And so a lot of my time that I was spending with her, I was intentionally having conversations with her that I knew I wasn't going to be able to have again. And so I was asking her quite specifically about what it was like to migrate, And I actually found out that she flew. She wasn't on the Windrush, I knew that. But she also didn't come on a boat that she'd flown, um, which I didn't know and I wouldn't have known had I not asked her. And I think the other thing that she did speak of, which I don't think really gets spoken of enough, is, is the fact that she wasn't at home to raise her own family. And she spoke about the sacrifice of, of the hours and what then occurs in your own home as a result of you not being there. And I, I hadn't really considered that until, you know, you have those chats. And tell me then about the effect that the Windrush scandal then has. So the Windrush is a crucial part of your life as soon as you're conscious, as soon as you're able to process stuff. Absolutely. And suddenly there's this Windrush scandal in Britain, this terrible hostile environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And tell me what effect that then had on you and on your family indeed. I mean, it really hurt. I found it exceptionally painful. I felt a huge disrespect to my gran, who by that point had actually passed away. And I remember feeling, I was really glad she didn't see it. I remember feeling that strongly. Like, I think it would have been really painful for her to see the country that, you know, like, I think migrants, immigrants' relationships to countries and diaspora changes each generation. My gran is definitely the generation that was like, I am British. She was a colonial subject, you know? And I think part of her identity because of her generation was that coming to the country to rebuild Britain after the war was her duty. Whereas my relationship to this country is not that at all, but that's a generational shift, a political shift. And I don't agree with my grand's perspective, but I really respected it. I really respected that's what she believed. And I think the idea that you would do that, which maybe for any of us, regardless of our race, to think about like a country inviting you somewhere and then being rejected, that, that's only an experience you can know if it has happened to you. I just think, you know, she'd moved her whole family here. She'd left her children for years. She'd not seen my granddad for years. And then she gets here and it's awful. And where she lived was awful and how she was treated was hideous. 
but she stayed. And then she died in the country, even though she wanted to go back home, which is also a very common story. And I just can't imagine how heartbroken she would have been. And so I do remember feeling really glad that she didn't live to see that. And then I felt guilty about that, obviously. And I think on a personal level, so like on my grand side, that's two generations later. On my mum's side, it's two generations later. On my dad's side, it's one. For me, I was just furious. I was livid. I could have burnt the place down. Like, I really was just so furious. And was that the sort of impetus for making this series of films? Absolutely. Absolutely. The work wouldn't have existed but for the Windrush scandal. I'm very sure. It was a very reactionary piece of work that I made because... You know, like I trained as a dancer and dance can be very expensive and very, which sounds ironic because I'm making film, but like it also requires sometimes a lot of permissions. Like you need a space and you need an audience and you need tickets and you need costume and you need all of these things, or at least it felt at the time like I needed all of these things. And it was easier for me to just take my computer and make something with what I had, which was at that time my 10-year-old MacBook Pro and my cracked version of Adobe. And I could do it in my house and nobody could stop me and I could just put it on the internet. And I didn't need permission. I didn't need an Arts Council grant. I could just do it. And luckily I'd had this tendency for many years, which I guess now is reflective of the fact that I'm a filmmaker, is that I collect footage. So I I actually had everything I needed. I had this file on my desktop called Stuff and Nonsense, and it had everything, everything I've ever seen, everything I've ever listened to that I found interesting. And so I just went in there, and that's how for them really happened. But I just, I felt like I couldn't let it happen without nobody saying anything or doing anything. And I remember at the time, my studio was at Somerset House, And I was just so furious that no one was speaking about it. Like no one in my professional spaces and none of the institutions were reacting. There was nothing in the newsletters. There was no, you know, you have to remember this is pre-National Windrush Day. This is pre all of the flooding of like guilt money to give us uh, visibility. Like this is like really before that. And like there was no Windrush Memorial programming it was just the scandal had happened and if you were from the community you knew because it affected your family or your friend's family or someone and if you weren't from the community you knew probably because you were left wing and already aware of the hostile environment and connected to some sort of activist scene or maybe you lived in Brixton or you lived in Peckham or you were like somewhere that the community were already screaming about it but It really felt like that outrage was very communal and the outrage in the industry, especially the arts industry, that on some level says it is supposed to be reflecting what's happening in the world, right? Like that's something that art can do. It really shocked me. And so I was just like, well, I'll say something and I'll make this commitment. I really love durational work. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'll make this film for the rest of my life or until we get reparations. Like, I can do that. Like, you know, and that really excited me also in terms of the material. Yeah, so you sort of knew from that very first instance, so, OK, I'm going to make a film, but it's not just a mm. one-off. This is a kind of lifelong project. Yeah, and I think that, like, really just speaks to my practice. Like, I really like durational work and a lot of what I work around, like, this, I work around this triptych that I have done for a decade now or more, which is repetition, duration and exhaustion. And I'm really interested in these three things, both in their materiality in, in, in performance or video work or print or, or whatever, but also politically. Like, I think they're really useful politically. And I'm a dancer, like I've done plies every day for like 20 odd years. Like I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with doing things again and again and again. So in a way, like the fact that for them is, is annual and, and repetitious and, and durational is more an indication of the fact that it is born out of my practice and continues a mode of inquiry around repetition, duration and exhaustion. Like the fourth one was, it was really hard. I was so exhausted by it. I was exhausted by the pandemic. I I really struggled. I definitely had regrets. (laughs) But you had a kind of, you were into your rhythm. You had a commitment to yourself as much as to a wider art community or whatever, or even even indeed your wider community in terms of, you know, your family and so on. So it was about, you knew there was this deadline you'd set yourself and you just delivered. 
Yeah, it's a landmark in my year. It's a landmark in my practice. And I think by now, because of the shift of, of politics, the shift of attention, because the work starts, like I said, pre-National Windrush Day, but it also starts pre the scale up of Black Lives Matter, pre the Black Square. Like, so now like the work has also been affected by a type of attention and visibility of good and bad of conversations around race as well. And I think what will prove interesting for this work over a longer period of time even than, than now is you'll be able to track the peaks and troughs of interest in a kind of critical race theory and maybe in, in a less kind of convoluted way, the lives of black people. Like, what are the lives of black people on an annual basis? How do I understand my life on an annual basis? It gives me a moment to reflect on this question I ask all the time is what it means to have a black life, you know, what it means for me to have a black queer life. It interests me that the Windrush Day falls in the Pride Month and as a lesbian, like, I'm, I'm often thinking about that and what it means to try and remember people and remember a community. And so it's, it's, it's kind of metronomic and, and yeah. repetition allows you to see change. I think that's what interests me about it. Tell me more about how each one differs and obviously let's focus on the latest iteration. Sure. I love this idea that you're pulling material from your stuff and nonsense mm-hmm. file or whatever. And, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah. But obviously each one has certain textures that repeat mm-hmm. and yep. then there are other elements that you introduce as a new element and so on. So tell us about this one. What's different about it? What did you want to focus on with this particular iteration? I think this iteration is, is maybe talking about consequence and is talking about reparations explicitly. And some of that is because reparations is something that I personally witness as being more topical in a mainstream way, and not just within the community. When I say the community, I mean anyone who wants reparations, I guess. Because within the community, the conversation is quite old. And various communities that were enslaved or colonised have been asking for reparations for, for decades. And that has been obviously dismissed to a large extent. But what has happened in the last year is that smaller institutions in the government have started to have conversations internally about reparative justice. Some countries have formally apologised, which does open them to liability, which is always something that has been avoided. And here in the UK, the question has come up in the Houses of Parliament and Rishi Sunak has said, we don't need to talk about this. We need to move forward, which is generally the UK's position. This is what David Cameron said in Jamaica whenever he was in power. And I feel like because this work does have a relationship to reparations, because the work is really, it is about the Windrush generation, but really the Windrush generation is a point on a whole timeline about slavery. You don't get people migrating from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana to the UK without talking about slavery because, frankly, they wouldn't be there, right? Like the Caribbean would be, if uncolonised, a place of indigenous people. But there was a huge genocide and they were all killed and then enslaved Africans were mostly killed, but definitely a big genocide, were brought in. So... In some ways, talking about the Windrush generation in isolation as a group who need reparative justice is disingenuous. It actually has to be connected to a longer history. And so it felt like it was important now to introduce these ideas within the work, especially for me on a personal level. I don't know if I'd always said this, but I had begun to say at some point, I don't remember, that I will make this work for the rest of my life or until we get reparations. So then I was like, okay, this work has a relationship to some sort of justice that you perceive. And so it might be important to start talking about that in the work and talking about, well, what is the consequence of our shared history? What is the consequence of the deepening of pockets of some and the reduction of wealth? And not just financial wealth, which is important, but also life expectancy, quality of life, housing, air quality, and so on, climate justice. And so that's where we're at with Madame Six. One of the powerful ways which you do this in the film is to include royal portraiture, for instance. So there's Elizabeth I, yeah. <laughs> but also these 
amazing documents, the transferal of stocks in the Royal African Company mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to w- William I, William of Orange. So you're linking it to royalty and therefore you're just immediately locking it in to the British state, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I think like the British people, we have such like bizarre relationships to history. It's kind of part of how the British identity is formed is to distance itself because it can literally geographically plantations were never here and so I feel like that geographical distance becomes a memory distance and a political distance I remember when I was making this for them my partner was like well are you going to talk about the new king and I was like "Mm, no I don't I don't want to but she had planted this seed about royalty and I think because of him coming into power and you know he's been asked questions and you know he keeps saying the the phrase deep regret (laughs) So I was like, all right, well, let's bring your regret in. Let's like, I think I like the phrase you use, you locked it in. Like, I think there's something about the British relationship to itself is that you have to lock it in. You have to make it undeniable. Like that is the level of discomfort that I think the UK has with its own relationship to slavery is that you have to lock it in and you have to lock it in annually. Like for them is like necessary because within a year people forget people deny. But also there's that convenient fact about abolition that people will trot out as soon as right. slavery is mentioned. They say, yeah, oh, but yeah, what yeah. about, what about <laughs> yeah, Britain's yeah. role in abolition though? Without being mindful of history and also what happened after abolition and so on. Yeah, Exactly. I always say it. Two things can be true at the same time. Like the, the story of abolition can be true and you could have also enslaved people for 400 years and you could have also become incredibly wealthy by the persecution and annihilation of a group of people and then at some point where it becomes financially impossible to sustain slavery which is really what happened it wasn't like suddenly the humanization of 3.4 million people in the Caribbean washed over the UK it was that it financially was a bad business move to keep doing this that you know the relationship to slavery shifts but we all know or we should know that it was the people who owned the plantations who were given millions of pounds. And this was never about the humanisation of black people or indeed the stolen labour. I wanted to ask you about the formal aspects of the piece because there are these sort of glitches. It's almost like a ticker tape of glitches along the bottom of the screen at times. You have Mm -hmm. these kind of abstract elements, digital elements. You have this procession of these kind of what look like AI figures that have got zeros and ones across them. (laughs) Which to me sounds up... Uh, perhaps a capitalist reference I don't know tell me more about some of the kind of devices if you like you use to like kind of formal devices you use I use a lot of stock footage in my work and, and I think some of that is is access like genuinely like that is what I could access at the time but I think as time has gone on and I've had conversations and indeed received critiques about the use of that material for me it's also it's a climate decision it's a decision to to recycle it's a decision to be in a dialogue with the same material and to maybe have a different conversation with myself as an artist about originality. The procession of people with the zeros and ones, I have them saved in my file as my army. And I think they have this like ethereal quality. I think I have this maybe fantasy of like all of the people who like jumped off slave ships from the ocean of just like walking out one day in this kind of like quite army way and you know, maybe a bit Pirates of the Caribbean and, you know, this kind of like coming back to reclaim. It's a bit like the Drexia bit. Yeah, exactly. Like I think and Drexia and like I use them again and again to represent people who lost their lives, who maybe won't be remembered or will be remembered differently because maybe they don't have ancestors, right? Like I also realise I'm the ancestor of people who survived at least for a period of time. But there are all these people who jumped and didn't. And so there's this kind of ethereal quality that they have that I use to represent that, but also the idea of like mass movement, just a mass of like any resistance takes mass, any progress takes collective hive kind of thinking. And the glitch, these like coloured bars, like I've been using that for many years. And again, that was a bit of, of stock footage I downloaded from YouTube about 10 years ago. And for me, like I use it as like an in, in a maybe quite clunky way to represent racism or to represent interference. Like there's a scene in, in For Them Six where I use it to cover my whole body. And at the same time, 
So Hilary Beckles is talking about it within the slave trade, the, the idea of an old African didn't exist. And it's this, it's this way of denoting what it can feel like or what it feels like to me to experience racism is this glitch in your psyche. It's this glitch in your day. Like you could be hanging out with your friends in the park and all of a sudden you're in a situation which is volatile and violent and racist. You can be popping to the shop and then somebody has, you know, yelled a slur at you and you just went to get milk. It's this real like glitch in how you see your life, you know, really. Like when you wake up and start your day, you're not necessarily holding the weight of what the world thinks of your body. But with throughout that day, you might get told what that is. And for me, that feels like a glitch. Zinzi, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Absolutely. I've had a blast. I'm so happy to be here. Zinzi Minutes of M6 is part of her exhibition Many Mickle Mecca Muckle at the Queer Circle Gallery in London until the 27th of August. <laughs> And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Julie Mahowska and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Alison and Martin, Nancy and Zinzi. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week for the last episode of the series. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.